reflections of each other. And I think that a normal society that discredits spiritual unfoldment and the ascendant human journey is always subject to that self-destructive um, impulse. And that's what it is. It's self-destruction in the same way that the unhappy um, wife who can't sit down with the husband and say, this isn't working. I don't want to be with you anymore. In the same way that the, the wife who can't do that will have an affair to bring about the destruction. Um, so it is with society that people will literally trash the place. And my belief is there's more pleasure and more catharsis and power in a way, although it's a negative shadow reflection in smashing than there is in looting. So if you actually look at those uh, clips, not that they're particularly pleasant to, to observe, but I don't think it's really about stealing running shoes and televisions and iPads and stuff. I think it's more about rage and it's more about an inner aggression that has very, very few articulations in a modern society. And that is, of course, a pressure cooker that, given the slightest excuse, will just blow. And so this this um, this kindling, you know, just a little tiny spark, and the whole thing goes up. And it is it is a, a little known fact that there are uh, a lot of riots uh, in England, not necessarily of this scale, but certainly in the north, there are many cities in uh, what used to be Lancashire and uh, Yorkshire where a lot of racial tensions, ethnic. Um, uh, divisions, uh, poverty, tensions will come out, and they usually come out in July and August. And that I've seen that year after year after year. And sometimes, as I say, they're relatively small in scale, and sometimes they're a lot larger. But historically, again, if you pull out and look at that, that pressure valve is almost like a controlled thing uh, that it, it's allowed to do that every now and again. The difference this time is that the extreme inadequacy of the British Prime Minister David Cameron's explanation of these things as criminality, which is basically the explanation he offered, criminality pure and simple, that is absolutely inadequate, absolutely nonsense thing to, to put forth. It's, a, it's shameful. And they're not even making the effort to explain it, basically. It's not necessarily about money. It's not necessarily just about education. It's something very deep in the English hierarchical social structures. And it, it is essentially a caste system. And the lower castes really have no social mobility, no economic prospects whatsoever. You can't just go to college and learn to be a plumber or a carpenter or a brain surgeon and then pull yourself out. That Those options are not available for millions of uh, Britons, they're just not there. So, would you say, in your in your opinion, would you agree with the analysis that says uh, the lower classes just watch the upper classes loot society wholesale with no consequences, and then in reaction, they do the same? Yeah, I've seen that. Yes, uh, it's hard to say no to that, let's put it that way. I've seen that meme um, bubble up from the alternative media and it started to surface in the mainstream media. This idea, as you say, that the uh, upper echelons of human society, this ex extreme minority, have been raping and pillaging on, on a grand scale for a long time, very deeply, in a very uh, disgusting manner. And people see that. And people have had to kind of swallow that for a long time. And particularly in Britain, where there has been this um, centuries and centuries of um, repression, not necessarily in the old fashioned medieval monarchy sense, but a lot of people in Europe are being, uh, have become accustomed to being told what to do. Now, of course, I'm happy to say that particularly in Britain, uh, as some, somewhere that I know very well, most people fundamentally are not going to put up with that indefinitely. They're going to, they're going to snap and they're going to do something about it. Um, but to suggest that that is just being um, exhibited through external violence in what 
some would call the underclass it is a misnomer really it's that's that's not a valid um viewpoint it's it's expressed in all strata of society <clears throat> and certainly the middle classes i would say are some of the most disenfranchised and disillusioned people you could come across in britain at the moment because they have been ransacked basically and people who have been working pretty hard for the last 30 40 years are now looking at a situation where they cannot really stop working still and now they're in the 60s and they, they kind of can't stop and the promise was a hollow promise and so i don't know what's worse having nothing and and you know being in a position where there's a very limited thing amount to lose or having uh invested in this system and being given these promises and these guarantees and then the rug has just been pulled from under the feet so that disenfranchisement runs throughout society um and it's not just britain it's i speak to people in um sweden and the netherlands and iceland um relatively frequently certainly several times a month and you know i'm hearing the same stories there and the the inadequacies of the economic system to support its population is also just laughable as well in that the the price of gasoline in in england is just is just crazy you know some people are having to stop using a car because they can't afford it so they you know many middle class families now are having to think before they hop in the car and go anywhere if that's actually doable right now and certainly what uh we would call working class families are definitely having to do that and they're definitely having to think about what's going in the sort of shopping cart every week whereas it wasn't always as bad as that but now it's it's really ridiculous so fundamentally i think that that observation that the system is unfair and is um is like a sort of roulette wheel that's rigged has has been understood at every class and at every level and at every conscious level and every vibration through the system and the people who are going to snap first are the people with the least to lose but when the middle classes snap then you've got a serious problem because they're the ones who basically float the economy with this illusion uh, by investing in it emotionally rather than anything else in my view and that is more fundamental that's starting to change because there comes a point i think where people realize that violence is a pretty short term pressure valve even for oneself or for a society or a government it's not really a, a long term strategy but when you stop purchasing and when you stop consuming and when you stop believing then there's a fundamental problem so any sort of shadow rulers who are tinkering with this game board at the moment are fully aware of this and they have they have a very significant quandary which is that that situation really isn't reversible now because politicians have just become um wholly um discredited and politics in the UK is just a, a sort of grotesque puppet show now um some would say it always has been but it's so transparent now that as i say even those um you know who are more accustomed to sort of dinner parties and um you know charity drives rather than bottles of whiskey on the street corner whoever they are whatever circles they move in everybody is saying the system doesn't work and it's not here for the benefit of the people and it isn't free and so that presents that very inescapable observation that well why is it like that who built it who who designed it in that manner and are there any precedents for this is there a, is there a, an alternative path and when it becomes obvious that it's been like that for a long time probably about 3 or 4000 years then there's a a very immediate and very hard dissonance cognitive dissonance that sets in which is just this wave of unsettling weird belief that everything that they thought they knew is wrong that then divides people into two categories those who do something about that and go on a journey an inner journey and an outer journey and those who just think this is too weird i'm just going to cross my fingers hope for the best maybe get a little a few more cans of beans in in the uh, in the cupboard and let's just hope it all blows over and goes back to normal and those divisions are widening at the moment and um of course 
it's really all about this disavowal of one's journey. And so the only path is to understand that you have to decrease your reliance on that system, physically, emotionally, mentally, everything. And you have to start to understand that the independence and the power and the decision-making doesn't come from anywhere else except from inside us. And we have to stop um, having this kind of, um, you know, uh, what's that syndrome where the, the high, the high, the, um, what's it called? The Stockholm syndrome, is it? Yes. Mm-hmm. Do you know that one? Right. That's where the hostages begin to identify with their captors. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And I think, uh, it, many people in society have that kind of, uh, mentality, uh, the way that the rich and powerful, uh, royals, etc., are held in such awe, the whole idea of celebrity status, uh, wealth, um, and I could agree with you in the sense that obviously the system is corrupt, uh, the foundations are cracking, uh, it's better to see it go down than to try to save something that's totally not able to be saved. On the other hand, there is this nagging voice that's intimating this thought that the creators of civilization are great. Their ideas are the reason we have so many good aspects to civilization. And the price of letting it collapse to the degree that it looks like it could, there's going to need to be some sort of massive, I don't want to say die off, but it, it looks pretty scary in some sense. And I know that's, you know, the fear versus this going through the fire process, but is it really worth taking that journey consciously when it may mean a serious tragedy on a large scale? Well, again, this, this makes us uh, think about how we perceive uh, the structure of reality. If we say, well, there's the 3D and that's it. And for a lot of people, that is people's conception of how the real world fits together. There's this three-dimensional world, very well described by mainstream science, and that's it. If if that is one's reality, then that 3D world is going to be severely rattled over the coming months and years. There's no doubt about it. And at another level, you could say, well, it seems to be that there is a natural seasonal shift from energy, kind of like with air pressure and how that creates wind as as the air moves from you know low to high and so on and so forth. There is this natural momentum where energy moves from this a lower dimensional state to a higher dimensional state. And so there's kind of some sort of phase shift. And the way I see it, and this is this is it my answer to that and uh, my observations about what you say, because it's an important point. The way I see it is that there's, there's a kind of phasing from a purely three dimensional aspect to a, a fourth dimensional aspect. And I don't necessarily mean some complete new world and a a totally new realm, like some Tolkien esque realm or something or some space alien realm, not necessarily like that at all. Just, I mean, in terms of a frequency shift that the whole solar system as a, in my view, as a conscious entity shifts up a gear, basically every so often, every six or 12 or 25,000 years, there are these incremental points where the whole thing moves and it moves in such a way that everything physically has to shift. And that favors those who have been working on that shift within themselves and shifts those who haven't into quite a different realm. And one of the markers for that movement is very extreme polarity. So where the good things are really good, as you say, there are some astonishingly good things about society and about the way we live our lives and about 
the technology, the very technology we're using now with 